This is section six of the Million Pound Banknote and Other Stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. About All Kinds of Ships by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. The Modern Steamer and the Obsolete Steamer. We are victims of one common superstition the superstition that we realize the changes that are daily taking place in the world because we read about them and know what they are i should not have supposed that the modern ship could be a surprise to me but it is it seems to be as much of a surprise to me as it could have been if i had never read anything about it i walk about this great vessel the havel as she ploughs her way through the atlantic and every detail that comes under my eye brings up the miniature counterpart of it as it existed in the little ships i crossed the ocean in fourteen seventeen eighteen and twenty years ago in the hovel one can be in several respects more comfortable than he can be in the best hotels on the continent of europe for instance she has several bathrooms, and they are as convenient and as nicely equipped as the bathrooms in a fine private house in America, whereas in the hotels of the continent one bathroom is considered sufficient, and it is generally shabby and located in some out-of-the-way corner of the house. Moreover, you need to give notice so long beforehand that you get over wanting a bath by the time you get it in the hotels there are a good many different kinds of noises and they spoil sleep in my room in the ship i hear no sounds in the hotels they usually shut off the electric light at midnight in the ship one may burn it in one's room all night in the steamer batavia twenty years ago one candle set in the bulkhead between two staterooms was there to light both rooms but did not light either of them it was extinguished at eleven at night and so were all the saloon lamps except one or two which were left burning to help the passenger see how to break his neck trying to get around in the dark the passengers sat at table on long benches made of the hardest kind of wood in the havel one sits on a swivel chair with a cushioned back to it in those old times the dinner-bill affair was always the same a pint of some simple homely soup or other boiled codfish and potatoes slab of boiled beef stewed prunes for dessert on sundays dog in a blanket on thursdays plum duff in the modern ship the menu is choice and elaborate and is changed daily in the old times dinner was a sad occasion in our day a concealed orchestra enlivens it with charming music in the old days the decks were always wet in our day they are usually dry for the promenade deck is roofed over and a sea seldom comes aboard in a moderately disturbed sea in the old days a landsman could hardly keep his legs but in such a sea in our day the decks are as level as a table in the old days the inside of a ship was the plainest and barrenest thing and the most dismal and uncomfortable that ingenuity could devise the modern ship is a marvel of rich and costly decoration and sumptuous appointment and is equipped with every comfort and convenience that money can buy the old ships had no place of assembly but the dining-room the new ones have several spacious and beautiful drawing-rooms the old ships offered the passenger no chance to smoke except in the place that was called the fiddle it was a repulsive den made of rough boards full of cracks and its office was to protect the main hatch it was grimy and dirty there were no seats the only light was a lamp of the rancid oil and rag kind the place was very cold and never dry for the seas broke in through the cracks every little while and drenched the cavern thoroughly in the modern ship there are three or four large smoking-rooms and they have card-tables and cushioned sofas and are heated by steam and lighted by electricity 
There are few European hotels with such smoking rooms. The former ships were built of wood, and had two or three watertight compartments in the hold with doors in them, which were often left open, particularly when the ship was going to hit a rock. The modern Leviathan is built of steel, and the watertight bulkheads have no doors in them. They divide the ship into nine or ten watertight compartments, and endow her with as many lives as a cat. Their complete efficiency was established by the happy results following the memorable accident to the city of Paris a year or two ago. One curious thing which is at once noticeable in the great modern ship is the absence of hubbub, clatter, rush of feet, roaring of orders. That is all gone by. The elaborate maneuvers necessary in working the vessel into her dock are conducted without sound. One sees nothing of the processes, hears no commands. A Sabbath stillness and solemnity reign in place of the turmoil and racket of the earlier days. The modern ship has a spacious bridge, fenced chin-high with sailcloth and floored with wooden gratings, and this bridge, with its fenced fore-and-aft annexes, could accommodate a seated audience of a hundred and fifty men. There are three steering equipments, each competent if the others should break. From the bridge the ship is steered, and also handled. The handling is not done by shout or whistle, but by signaling with patent automatic gongs. There are three tell-tales with plainly lettered dials for steering, handling the engines, and for communicating orders to the invisible mates who are conducting the landing of the ship or casting off. The officer who is astern is out of sight and too far away to hear trumpet calls, but the gongs near him tell him to haul in, pay out, make fast, let go, and so on. He hears, but the passengers do not, and so the ship seems to land herself without human help. This great bridge is thirty or forty feet above the water, but the sea climbs up there sometimes, so there is another bridge twelve or fifteen feet higher still for use in these emergencies. The force of water is a strange thing. It slips between one's fingers like air, but upon occasion it acts like a solid body and will bend a thin iron rod. In the havel, it has splintered a heavy oaken rail into broom straws instead of merely breaking it in two as would have been the seemingly natural thing for it to do at the time of the awful johnstown disaster according to the testimony of several witnesses rocks were carried some distance on the surface of the stupendous torrent and at st helena many years ago a vast sea wave carried a battery of cannon forty feet up a steep slope and deposited the guns there in a row but the water has done a still stranger thing and it is one which is credibly vouched for a marlin spike is an implement about a foot long which tapers from its butt to the other extremity and ends in a sharp point it is made of iron and is heavy a wave came aboard a ship in a storm and raged aft, breast high, carrying a marlin spike point first with it, and with such lightning like swiftness and force as to drive it three or four inches into a sailor's body and kill him. In all ways, the ocean greyhound of today is imposing and impressive to one who carries in his head no ship pictures of a recent date. In bulk she comes near to rivaling the ark. Yet this monstrous mass of steel is driven five hundred miles through the waves in twenty-four hours. I remember the brag run of a steamer which I traveled in once on the Pacific. It was two hundred and nine miles in twenty-four hours. A year or so later I was a passenger in the excursion tub Quaker City, and on one occasion, in a level and glassy sea, it was claimed that she reeled off two hundred and eleven miles between noon and noon, but it was probably a campaign lie. That little steamer had seventy passengers and a crew of forty men, and seemed a good deal of a beehive. But in this present ship we are living in, a sort of solitude, these soft summer days, 
with sometimes a hundred passengers scattered about the spacious distances and sometimes nobody in sight at all yet hidden somewhere in the vessel's bulk there are including crew near eleven hundred people the stateliest lines in the literature of the sea are these britannia needs no bulwark no towers along the steep her march is o'er the mountain wave her home is on the deep there it is in those old times the little ships climbed over the waves and wallowed down into the trough on the other side the giant ship of our day does not climb over the waves but crushes her way through them her formidable weight and mass and impetus give her mastery over any but extraordinary storm waves the ingenuity of man i mean in this passing generation to-day i found in the chart-room a frame of removable wooden slats on the wall and on the slats was painted uninforming information like this trim tank empty double bottom number one full double bottom number two full double bottom number three full double bottom number four full while i was trying to think out what kind of a game this might be and how a stranger might best go to work to beat it a sailor came in and pulled out the empty end of the first slat and put it back with its reverse side to the front marked full he made some other change i did not notice what the slat frame was soon explained its function was to indicate how the ballast in the ship was distributed the striking thing was that that ballast was water i did not know that a ship had ever been ballasted with water i had merely read some time or other that such an experiment was to be tried but that is the modern way between the experimental trial of a new thing and its adoption there is no wasted time if the trial proves its value on the wall near the slat frame there was an outline drawing of the ship and this betrayed the fact that this vessel has twenty-two considerable lakes of water in her these lakes are in her bottom they are imprisoned between her real bottom and a false bottom they are separated from each other thwart ships by water-tight bulkheads and separated down the middle by a bulkhead running from the bow four-fifths of the way to the stern it is a chain of lakes four hundred feet long and from five to seven feet deep fourteen of the lakes contain fresh water brought from shore and the aggregate weight of it is four hundred tons the rest of the lakes contain salt water six hundred and eighteen tons upwards of a thousand tons of water altogether think how handy this ballast is the ship leaves port with the lakes all full as she lightens forward through consumption of coal she loses trim her head rises her stern sinks down then they spill one of the sternward lakes into the sea and the trim is restored this can be repeated right along as occasion may require also a lake at one end of the ship can be moved to the other end by pipes and steam pumps when the sailor changed the slat frame today he was posting a transference of that kind the seas had been increasing and the vessel's head needed more waiting to keep it from rising on the waves instead of ploughing through them therefore twenty-five tons of water had been transferred to the bow from a lake situated well toward the stern a water compartment is kept either full or empty the body of water must be compact so that it cannot slosh around a shifting ballast would not do of course the modern ship is full of beautiful ingenuities but it seems to me that this one is the king i would rather be the originator of that idea than of any of the others perhaps the trim of a ship was never perfectly ordered and preserved until now a vessel out of trim will not steer her speed is maimed she strains and labors in the seas poor creature for six thousand years she has had no comfort until these latest days for six thousand years she swam through the best and cheapest ballast in the world the only perfect ballast but she couldn't tell her master and he had not the wit to find it out for himself it is odd to reflect that there is nearly as much water inside of this ship as there is outside 
and yet there is no danger noah's ark the progress made in the great art of shipbuilding since noah's time is quite noticeable also the looseness of the navigation laws in the time of noah is in quite striking contrast with the strictness of the navigation laws of our time it would not be possible for noah to do in our day what he was permitted to do in his own experience has taught us the necessity of being more particular more conservative more careful of human life noah would not be allowed to sail from bremen in our day the inspectors would come and examine the ark and make all sorts of objections a person who knows germany can imagine the scene and the conversation without difficulty and without missing a detail the inspector would be in a beautiful military uniform he would be respectful dignified kindly the perfect gentleman but steady as the north star to the last requirement of his duty he would make noah tell him where he was born and how old he was and what religious sect he belonged to and the amount of his income and the grade and position he claimed socially and the name and style of his occupation and how many wives and children he had and how many servants and the name sex and age of the whole of them and if he hadn't a passport he would be courteously required to get one right away then he would take up the matter of the ark what is her length six hundred feet depth sixty five beam fifty or sixty built of wood what kind sheetum and gopher interior and exterior decorations pitched within and without passengers eight sex half male the others female ages from a hundred years up up to where six hundred ah going to chicago good idea too surgeon's name we have no surgeon must provide a surgeon also an undertaker particularly the undertaker these people must not be left without the necessities of life at their age crew the same eight the same eight the same eight and half of them women yes sir have they ever served as seamen no sir have the men no sir have any of you ever been to sea no sir where were you reared on a farm all of us this vessel requires a crew of eight hundred men she not being a steamer you must provide them she must have four mates and nine cooks who is the captain i am sir you must get a captain also a chambermaid also six nurses for the old people who designed this vessel i did sir is it your first attempt yes sir i partly suspected it cargo animals kind all kinds wild or tame mainly wild foreign or domestic mainly foreign principal wild ones megatherium elephant rhinoceros lion tiger wolf snakes all the wild things of all climes two of each securely caged no not caged they must have iron cages who feeds and waters the menagerie we do the old people yes sir it is dangerous for both the animals must be cared for by a competent force how many animals are there big ones seven thousand big and little together ninety-eight thousand you must provide twelve hundred keepers how is the vessel lighted by two windows where are they up under the eaves two windows for a tunnel six hundred feet long and sixty-five feet deep you must put in the electric light a few arc lights and fifteen hundred incandescents what do you do in case of leaks how many pumps have you none sir you must provide pumps how do you get water for the passengers and the elephants we let down the buckets from the windows it is inadequate what is your motive power what is my which motive power what power do you use in driving the ship none you must provide sails or steam 
what is the nature of your steering apparatus we haven't any haven't you a rudder no sir how do you steer the vessel we don't you must provide the rudder and properly equip it how many anchors have you none you must provide six one is not permitted to sail a vessel like this without that protection how many lifeboats have you none sir provide twenty-five how many life preservers none you will provide two thousand how long are you expecting your voyage to last eleven or twelve months eleven or twelve months pretty slow but you will be in time for the exposition what is your ship sheathed with copper her hull is bare not sheathed at all dear man the wood-boring creatures of the sea would riddle her like a sieve and send her to the bottom in three months she cannot be allowed to go away in this condition she must be sheathed just a word more have you reflected that chicago is an inland city and not reachable with a vessel like this she cargo what is she cargo i am not going to she cargo indeed then may i ask what the animals are for just to breed others from others is it possible that you haven't enough for the present needs of civilization yes but the rest are going to be drowned in a flood and these are to renew the supply a flood yes sir are you sure of that perfectly sure it is going to rain forty days and forty nights give yourself no concern about that dear sir it often does that here not this kind of rain this is going to cover the mountain tops and the earth will pass from sight privately but of course not officially i am sorry you revealed this for it compels me to withdraw the option i gave you as to sails or steam i must require you to use steam your ship cannot carry the hundredth part of an eleven months water supply for the animals you will have to have condensed water but i tell you i am going to dip water from outside with buckets it will not answer before the flood reaches the mountain tops the fresh waters will have joined the salt seas and it will all be salt you must put in steam and condense your water i will now bid you good-bye sir did i understand you to say that this was your very first attempt at shipbuilding my very first sir i give you the honest truth i built this ark without having ever had the slightest training or experience or instruction in marine architecture it is a remarkable work sir a most remarkable work i consider that it contains more features that are new absolutely new and unhackneyed than are to be found in any other vessel that swims the seas this compliment does me infinite honor dear sir infinite and i shall cherish the memory of it while life shall last sir i offer my duty and most grateful thanks adieu no the german inspector would be limitlessly courteous to noah and would make him feel that he was among friends but he wouldn't let him go to sea with that ark columbus's craft between noah's time and the time of columbus naval architecture underwent some changes and from being unspeakably bad was improved to a point which may be described as less unspeakably bad i have read somewhere some time or other that one of columbus's ships was a ninety-ton vessel by comparing that ship with the ocean greyhounds of our time one is able to get down to a comprehension of how small that spanish bark was and how little fitted she would be to run opposition in the atlantic passenger trade to-day it would take seventy-four of her to match the tonnage of the hovel and carry the hovel's trip if i remember rightly it took her ten weeks to make the passage with our ideas this would now be considered an objectionable gait she probably had a captain a mate and a crew consisting of four seamen and a boy the crew of a modern greyhound numbers two hundred and fifty persons columbus's ship being small and very old we know that we may draw from these two facts several absolute certainties in the way of minor details which history has left unrecorded for instance 
being small we know that she rolled and pitched and tumbled in an ordinary sea and stood on her head or her tail or lay down with her ear in the water when storm seas ran high also that she was used to having billows plunge aboard and wash her decks from stem to stern also that the storm racks were on the table all the way over and that nevertheless a man's soup was oftener landed in his lap than in his stomach also that the dining saloon was about ten feet by seven dark airless and suffocating with oil stench also that there was only about one stateroom the size of a grave with a tier of two or three berths in it of the dimensions and comfortableness of coffins and that when the light was out the darkness in there was so thick and real that you could bite into it and chew it like gum also that the only promenade was on the lofty poop deck astern for the ship was shaped like a high quarter shoe a streak sixteen feet long by three feet wide all the rest of the vessel being littered with ropes and flooded by the seas we know all these things to be true from the mere fact that we know the vessel was small as the vessel was old certain other truths follow as matters of course for instance she was full of rats she was full of cockroaches the heavy seas made her seams open and shut like your fingers and she leaked like a basket where leakage is there also of necessity is bilge water and where bilge water is only the dead can enjoy life this is on account of the smell in the presence of bilge water limburger cheese becomes odorless and ashamed from these absolutely sure data we can competently picture the daily life of the great discoverer in the early morning he paid his devotions at the shrine of the virgin at eight bells he appeared on the poop deck promenade if the weather was chilly he came up clad from plumed helmet to spurred heel in magnificent plate armor inlaid with arabesques of gold having previously warmed it at the galley fire if the weather was warm he came up in the ordinary sailor toggery of the time great slouch hat of blue velvet with a flowing brush of snowy ostrich plumes fastened on with a flashing cluster of diamonds and emeralds gold embroidered doublet of green velvet with slashed sleeves exposing under sleeves of crimson satin deep collar and cuff ruffles of rich limp lace trunk hose of pink velvet with big knee knots of brocaded yellow ribbon pearl tinted silk stockings clocked and daintily embroidered lemon-colored buskins of unborn kid funnel-topped and drooping low to expose the pretty stockings deep gauntlets of finest white heretic skin from the factory of the holy inquisition formerly part of the person of a lady of rank rapier with sheath crusted with jewels and hanging from a broad baldric upholstered with rubies and sapphires he walked the promenade thoughtfully he noted the aspects of the sky and the course of the wind he kept an eye out for drifting vegetation and other signs of land he jawed the man at the wheel for pastime he got out an imitation egg and kept himself in practice on his old trick of making it stand on its end now and then he hove a lifeline below and fished up a sailor who was drowning on the quarter-deck the rest of his watch he gaped and yawned and stretched and said he wouldn't make the trip again to discover six americas for that was the kind of natural human person columbus was when not posing for posterity at noon he took the sun and ascertained that the good ship had made three hundred yards in twenty-four hours and this enabled him to win the pool anybody can win the pool when nobody but himself has the privilege of straightening out the ship's run and getting it right the admiral has breakfast alone in state bacon beans and gin at noon he dines alone in state bacon beans and gin at six he sups alone in state bacon beans and gin at eleven p m he takes a night relish alone in state bacon beans and gin at none of these orgies is there any music the ship orchestra is modern after his final meal 
he returned thanks for his many blessings a little overrating their value perhaps and then he laid off his silken splendors or his gilded hardware and turned in in his little coffin bunk and blew out his flickering stencher and began to refresh his lungs with inverted sighs freighted with the rich odors of rancid oil and bilge water the sighs returned as snores and then the rats and the cockroaches swarmed out in brigades and divisions and army corps and had a circus all over him such was the daily life of the great discoverer in his marine basket during several historic weeks and the difference between his ship and his comforts and ours is visible almost at a glance when he returned the king of spain marveling said as history records this ship seems to be leaky did she leak badly you shall judge for yourself sire i pumped the atlantic ocean through her sixteen times on the passage this is general horace porter's account other authorities say fifteen it can be shown that the differences between that ship and the one i am writing these historical contributions in are in several respects remarkable take the matter of decoration for instance i have been looking around again yesterday and today and have noted several details which i conceive to have been absent from columbus's ship or at least slurred over and not elaborated and perfect i observe stateroom doors three inches thick of solid oak and polished i note companionway vestibules with walls doors and ceilings panelled in polished hardwoods some light some dark all dainty and delicate joiner work and yet every joint compact and tight with beautiful pictures inserted composed of blue tiles some of the pictures containing as many as sixty tiles and the joinings of those tiles perfect these are daring experiments one would have said that the first time the ship went straining and laboring through a storm-tumbled sea those tiles would gape apart and drop out that they have not done so is evidence that the joiner's art has advanced a good deal since the days when ships were so shackly that when a giant sea gave them a wrench the doors came unbolted i find the walls of the dining saloon upholstered with mellow pictures wrought in tapestry and the ceiling aglow with pictures done in oil in other places of assembly i find great panels filled with embossed spanish leather the figures rich with gilding and bronze everywhere i find sumptuous masses of color 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 all about color of every shade and tint and variety and as a result the ship is bright and cheery to the eye and this cheeriness invades one's spirit and contents it to fully appreciate the force and spiritual value of this radiant and opulent dream of color one must stand outside at night in the pitch dark and the rain and look in through a port and observe it in the lavish splendor of the electric lights the old-time ships were dull plain graceless gloomy and horribly depressing they compelled the blues one could not escape the blues in them the modern idea is right to surround the passenger with conveniences luxuries and abundance of inspiriting color as a result the ship is the pleasantest place one can be in except perhaps one's home a vanished sentiment one thing is gone to return no more forever the romance of the sea soft sentimentality about the sea has retired from the activities of this life and is but a memory of the past already remote and much faded but within the recollection of men still living it was in the breast of every individual and the further any individual lived from salt water the more of it he kept in stock it was as pervasive as universal as the atmosphere itself the mere mention of the sea the romantic sea would make any company of people sentimental and mawkish at once the great majority of the songs that were sung by the young people of the back settlements had the melancholy wanderer for subject and his mouthings about the sea for refrain 
picnic parties paddling down a creek in a canoe when the twilight shadows were gathering always sang homeward bound homeward bound from a foreign shore and this also was a favorite in the west with the passengers on stern-wheel steamboats there was another my boat is by the shore and my bark is on the sea and before i go tom moore here's a double health to thee and this one also o oh, pilot tis a fearful night there's danger on the deep and this a life on the ocean wave and a home on the rolling deep where the scattered waters rave and the winds their revels keep and this a wet sheet and a flowing sea and a wind that follows fair and this my foot is on my gallant deck once more the rover is free and the larboard watch the person referred to below is at the masthead or somewhere up there oh who can tell what joy he feels as o'er the foam his vessel reels and his tired eyelids slumbering fall he rouses at the welcome call of larboard watch ahoy yes and there was forever and always some jackass-voiced person braying out rocked in the cradle of the deep i lay me down in peace to sleep other favorites had these suggestive titles the storm at sea the bird at sea the sailor boy's dream the captive pirate's lament we are far from home on the stormy main and so on and so on the list is endless everybody on a farm lived chiefly amid the dangers of the deep in those days in fancy but all that is gone now not a vestige of it is left the ironclad with her unsentimental aspect and frigid attention to business banished romance from the war marine and the unsentimental steamer has banished it from the commercial marine the dangers and uncertainties which made sea life romantic have disappeared and carried the poetic element along with them in our day the passengers never sing sea songs on board a ship and the band never plays them pathetic songs about the wanderer in strange lands far from home once so popular and contributing such fire and color to the imagination by reason of the rarity of that kind of wanderer have lost their charm and fallen silent because everybody is a wanderer in the far lands now and the interest in that detail is dead nobody is worried about the wanderer there are no perils of the sea for him there are no uncertainties he is safer in the ship than he would probably be at home for there he is always liable to have to attend some friend's funeral and stand over the grave in the sleet bareheaded and that means pneumonia for him if he gets his deserts and the uncertainties of his voyage are reduced to whether he will arrive on the other side in the appointed afternoon or have to wait till morning the first ship i was ever in was a sailing vessel she was twenty-eight days going from san francisco to the sandwich islands but the main reason for this particularly slow passage was that she got becalmed and lay in one spot fourteen days in the center of the pacific two thousand miles from land i hear no sea songs in this present vessel but i heard the entire layout in that one there were a dozen young people they are pretty old now i reckon and they used to group themselves on the stern in the starlight or the moonlight every evening and sing sea songs till after midnight in that hot silent motionless calm they had no sense of humor and they always sang homeward bound without reflecting that that was practically ridiculous since they were standing still and not proceeding in any direction at all and they often followed that song with are we almost there are we almost there said the dying girl as she drew near home it was a very pleasant company of young people and i wonder where they are now gone oh none knows whither and the bloom and grace and beauty of their youth where is that among them was a liar all tried to reform him but none could do it and so gradually he was left to himself none of us would associate with him 
many a time since i have seen in fancy that forsaken figure leaning forlorn against the taffrail and have reflected that perhaps if we had tried harder and been more patient we might have won him from the fault and persuaded him to relinquish it but it is hard to tell with him the vice was extreme and was probably incurable i like to think and indeed i do think that i did the best that lay in me to lead him to higher and better ways there was a singular circumstance the ship lay becalmed that entire fortnight in exactly the same spot then a handsome breeze came fanning over the sea and we spread our white wings for flight the vessel did not budge the sails bellied out the gale strained at the ropes but the vessel moved not a hair's breadth from her place the captain was surprised it was some hours before we found out what the cause of the detention was it was barnacles they collect very fast in that part of the pacific they had fastened themselves to the ship's bottom then others had fastened themselves to the first bunch others to these and so on down and down and down and the last bunch had glued the column hard and fast to the bottom of the sea which is five miles deep at that point so the ship was simply become the handle of a walking cane five miles long yes and no more movable by wind and sail than a continent is it was regarded by every one as remarkable well the next week however sandy hook is in sight end of about all kinds of ships by mark twain read by john greenman